Oh, uh, again. So now we are going to continue with page faults, basically. Uh, we have a couple of uh, words left uh, for address translation as well, but mainly we are going to focus on uh, page faults. Uh, so this is the mechanism behind uh, operating system intervention, intervention in uh, the memory management unit, not finding the uh, page on the page table. The reason can be uh, legal, legal or illegal, as I said in the previous hour. Uh, thing is, some of the pages can be restored, so they are not in the address translation. So there is no physical correspondence of them. But uh, access is legal, so operating system has a chance to recover them. The examples of such are the page can be swept out or page wasn't accessed at all uh, or uh, there is another mechanism uh, which is uh, available between parent and child and uh, we are going to talk about those and give their names. Uh, one is page eviction. We will talk about them in the next chapter. Uh, the other is demand paging and the later one, the parent-child relation is uh, copy on write. And all of them are provided by a single mechanism, CPU, letting operating system know that this page simply does not exist in the address translation tables. So operating system will do either this legal recovery or it is going to give just a simple error. And you all know the mechanism how kernel tells process about this error. Yes, it is signals. Uh, our uh, segmentation for protection fault family of uh, signals are for this purpose. So uh, page fault mechanism is an interrupt and the CPU is generating the interrupt because MMU is inside of the CPU. It couldn't, it went to TRB, miss, it went to page tables, miss, so it generates an interrupt. And the page fault handler of the operating system takes control and determines what to do. Uh, first of all, let us go over again how MMU determines it doesn't exist. At the page tables, uh, the reference PTE entry exists actually, uh, but PTE entry can be invalid. So basically for each uh, page, we can traverse the page table and find out the PTA entry, page table entry. And it simply doesn't have a correct value. And we understand that uh, through this valid bit redefined here. This valid bit tells us that it is not valid. So it simply does not exist. So we need to bring it in the page table and mark this uh, bit as well it later. Okay, so this is the idea. Uh, and now we are going to talk about demand paging. Uh, and the question is, does a, does a process need to keep all of its pages in memory all the time? And the answer is no, because a process is typically <laughs> Uh, using only a small portion of its uh, memory. So let us see how this is uh, possible. So well, we can have this. A uh, program is using only uh, this part, this part, and Sorry, can be using only this part.
this part, some part of stack, some part of local variables, and some part of code. So the rest has to be black in this notation. That means not brought in the memory at all. So we can start with an empty memory and we can grow up memory as process accesses them. And thanks to PageVault, this is possible with help of operating system and CPU interrupt PageVault. So it will look like this. So initially it will look like this and it will grow as we reference them. It will look like this. We reference that in the next instruction. It will be a page vault. The operating system will take it from this or if it is a zero page, it will come from zeros. It is brought into page table. And then the next access, TLV and page table will contain it. So it will be available. So it will be like a dynamic, lazy grow of uh, virtual memory. So uh, some of the pages can be in secondary storage. This is actually uh, used, but paged out pages. Uh, some of the pages are not accessed at all. That means they are new. So your program has started just now. So they had to be taken uh, from some other place, secondary storage. Or if it is zero, it's, it can initialize to zero. And some of the uh, pages are coming from read-only text pages from the binary and so on. Uh, so I'm going to show you this uh, to get a better idea. I had prepared a couple of examples. Uh, and the first example is this demand paging example. It is similar to just our previous example where we have uh, created this initialized, non-initialized segments. But uh, now uh, we are not interested in the non-initialized part. We are uh, going to use, actually, uh, we can do the same experiment here as well, initialize and non-initialize segments. Uh, but uh, I'm going to show it on this heap variable, which is uh, larger than the others, which is like 30 million integers. So it is like, uh, 120 million bytes. Uh, and then I'm expecting this heap uh, segment to start with a large area mapping as I have this malloc. So it will be like 120 megabytes will be mapped into memory, but not in the physical memory if we have demand paging. That means the actual memory that our process uses is uh, shorter than uh, 120 megabytes. However, in this loop, if you look into this part, you will see that I am making an access. This access can be read only or read write. It doesn't matter for just to, uh, just I have chosen to update it. Uh, probably optimizer may remove if you didn't, uh, didn't use this area. So uh, in order to get rid of the optimizer, I just put one of the bytes I. So I am incrementing the memory area by 500 and uh, once in 500 bytes, I update the memory. And I sleep for two milliseconds, something like that. And then I report something. So this loop will go like many times, and it is going to just uh, update some of the pages. Actually, it will update all of the pages, some of the bytes, but only it will update uh, all of the pages because a page is like four kilobytes, and once in 500, I'm going to make an update. So it is uh, like in uh, one second, it will update like two or three megabytes of uh, memory and in demand paging, it will bring uh, memory into physical. 
So let us execute this code here. Part of the screen. If we, I can start it here. Oh, it has started, it is waiting for me to press a key, so it is not directly executing. Uh, and I'm going to show you htop. htop is the list of uh, listing the current processes in my system. So uh, this is my Oops, my program process. And if you uh, notice these numbers, uh, the virtual here versus resident. So virtual size is 116 megabytes, and the resident, which means the physically mapped memory uh, of this process is 716 kilobytes. So we have megabytes versus kilobytes. And uh, now I am going to let this inner for loop start. And this process starts consuming some memory. So please watch this demand paging. So it went to here, resident size getting six megabytes, eight megabytes, nine megabytes, 11 megabytes. It can get, it's getting larger and larger as you see. And so it is 22, 23. So as the small percentage at the lower bottom part of the screen goes larger, it is going to uh, approach this 116 megabytes. And it is going to use all of them. Basically, you will see 116 something, or close, close to 116. Uh, and this is how uh, a newly started process, uh, process memory uh, grows. It will start like zero bytes resident, and from that, by getting page faults one after another, uh, it will get uh, larger and larger. So uh, demand paging uh, may look uh, some time-consuming task, but it is not because uh, bringing everything in advanced has a cost, and through a page fault has a cost, and those costs are uh, close to each other. Uh, by demand paging, you uh, do not load all of the pages, and this is the uh, advantage of that. This is what you uh, get out of this demand paging. Now it is like at the end, and now you are going to see uh, the Okay, it gets 90 and you will see 116 or something close to it. Because still there might be some pages which are not mapped yet. Uh, okay, so that's the end. If I press another number, it will just disappear. I would like to show you uh, also PMAP so that do not confuse demand paging with this area. The area grow is something else. I'm going to show you that as well. Uh, in the other translation part, I'm going to show you that as well. Uh, so now it is working. So this is my process. And if you see process memory, you will see this 116 megabyte here in this number. And uh, when you let this part go, the segment 
will not change. So this area is over there. As soon as you allocate memory, it is going to get that value. But you are allocating them, but not using them. As you use that, the process, the operating system is growing that. So now you are not going to see much of a difference because it is already allocated. But if you call malloc, the situation will be different. Uh, malloc will uh, make this heap grow. And I have an example of that as well. Okay, so this is uh, demand paging uh, on work. So now let us go back to our presentation and continue. Okay. So this is like that. Uh, so uh, the page faults uh, bring in pages from uh, different resources. In uh, our example, it was uh, just uh, heap variables, and heap variables uh, doesn't have an initial content. So operating system will simply give you just a, a page fill, fill bit zeros. So it will, it will be uh, okay for you. But in case of, uh, for example, a program's binary, it will be uh, different. It, sh it should be taken out from a file. For example, you have a 100 megabytes binary, a large software. Uh, the executable part is like 10 megabytes. So, but you jump to main and waiting for user input to go on. So main is like a single page and you are waiting on that page and the remaining uh, nine megabytes something is not loaded yet. But when you jump out of main to some function, then it is going to uh, load that page and it will go like that. So uh, your code will be bring it uh, brought in by the file. So it is uh, and uh, page fault operation requiring I.O. And uh, I would like to show you a PMAP again to make that more sense. Uh, so going back here, if you noticed, there are files here. So this demand paging is not name of the process. It is the uh, name of the file. That means those areas are mapped to different areas of that file. So that means if you have a page fault in some area of that file, it is just uh, four kilobytes, so it will not be a big deal. Uh, however, if you had so, for example, this one is a one megabyte file, which is libc, uh, when you uh, access different areas of libc, it is standard C library, by the way, uh, it has started bringing pages from where the libc file. So this file is somewhere on this. So if you ask this question, it's going to give you the position of the file. I believe this one is turning out into our libc, okay? So this file contains the executable uh, binary executable instructions of the uh, program, the libc, and uh, you're just getting them page by page into memory just to execute them. And when your function goes from one instruction to the next one, the next page is loaded. And this way, you will not have a whole libc in your code. There are larger binaries, even this one is one megabyte. Uh, you don't need all of them. You are using only printf and a couple of other functions. So you, on, you are only using two pages, three pages out of libc. Okay. That's the nice thing about it. Uh,
So what about uninitialized variables and heap? So I have actually give you a spoiler about that. Uh, uninitialized variables are coming from zero. So we will have zero pages for them. Uh, so demand paging loads a fresh allocated physical uh, frame and gives it a zero. That's it. Doing uh, the first access of that, it will get from the zero page. Uh, so page fault occurs, operating system looks at the page and see that it's a zero page. The anonymous uh, word you have seen in the examples means it's a zero page initially. Uh, not at the moment, but initially it was a zero page. Uh, it will allocate this new physical frame and sets all of them to zero. Uh, um, why is a good question here. Why do we initialize that to zero? Why do we have to spend CPU time to make it all zeros, not as it is? The answer is related to what was there before? We are initializing it to zero. Before that, what did that page contain? Another program's memory probably, and that, we, that could be an important security problem because that process uh, may, be, may be belonging to another user, another process. So it can be a security issue. So you should always uh, clean up the pages when you are giving it to another process. Uh, of course, uh, the position can be different. For example, when you are deallocating, you can make it zero. It is not a wise choice. Uh, by the way, I'm going to talk about that in the next chapter. So you do uh, initialize it when you allocate and give to a new process. And the actual thing is slightly different. I'm going to talk about that in the copy on write section. Uh, so uh, the heap is similar, uh, but we have uh, one simple difference uh, between heap and the global variables. Uh, in the heap, as you uh, know, uh, you can allocate one byte, two bytes, four bytes, eight bytes. Uh, and one good question is, uh, does uh, that request, four byte allocation request, uh, arrives at operating system or not? Operating system is too busy to deal with this tiny pieces of uh, simple uh, memory areas. Uh, so what it concerns us, what it is interested in is just to deal with larger memory, the pages. So operating system works on page boundaries. And within the page, whatever you can do, you can. But it gives you page by page allocation in the finer uh, uh, case. So uh, who handles within the page case? Who handles your four bytes? And the answer is C library. Our C library has an allocator. Uh, it can deal with this tiny pieces. It has data structures dealing with those uh, tiny areas of segments, uh, dealing with fragmentation, etc. It is the job of C library allocator. Uh, and when it needs actual memory, it asks operating system to give more memory in the heap. Okay, so this is the case. So uh, the demand paging or paging has not uh, only uh, advantage of this lazy allocation of pages, but also the mappings can be shared. So mapping is like a pointer from one array index to the another. And what happens if two pointers point to the same area? For example, we have two shells and two shell code is exactly the same. It is read only by the way. So do we have to make a copy in one shell, another copy in one shell of the 
exactly the same bytes? And the answer is no. And who is going to maintain this? Of course, we have other this translation and uh, the PTE of those pages here, okay, is the same for the PT in this address translation, uh, sorry, the frame address here is listed in PT of this, uh, PT of this, both memory management units point to the same, and that's it. That will solve your, most of your problem. Of course, you need uh, to keep track of number of reference to each frame and so on, but the rest is quite easy. So this will uh, end up in ver something very interesting. If you have thousand processes in an operating system, each of them are using libc. libc is one megabyte. Thousand processes, one megabyte libc is one gigabyte of libc. No, it is just one megabyte of libc shared by 1000 processes. And uh, it will uh, make your memory usage much more efficient for read-only pages. What about read-write pages? Actually, we have seen this. We talked about in the interprocess communication that we can map uh, areas of memory shared by multiple processes so that they can exchange information through that. But SHM, get SHM, attach, attach, and so on. Uh, this mechanism is exactly similar to uh, code sharing or file sharing. We are creating the physical memory area, mark it as shared, and the mapping is the same. And the other translation maps exactly the same pages to uh, uh, addresses to same pages, same frames. That's it. Uh, memory map files are handled in the same way. So we uh, memory maps a file or region of a file into memory. It will be available in the uh, virtual memory area and then we just keep using it. And multiple processes can map the same file so they are going to access the same file. If you remember in IPC, we talked about this. Uh, by using MMAP, you can have shared memory. And this shared memory will also uh, have a reflection on the actual uh, files. Uh, I can uh, show it to you. I can find my sources here. So I have a shared memory example here. This is my example. And if you look at the process map of map of this process, you will see, okay, I didn't, so I need input here, so sorry about this. This example, this is shared the example. I have this editor and if you look into the uh, memory area of this, you are going to see a region which is marked as shared. This one, okay. So this one tells us that uh, it is a memory mapped file. That means uh, those areas here of this process will be mapped to pages of this file. And uh, 
for the uh, paging subsystem, uh, this file pages are not duplicated. Only one frame is allocated per page of this file. And they are shared among the multiple processes. So the same thing, um, address translation will give you this uh, frame, or uh, which frame is backed by this file. It is a mechanism. Okay. So now, this is the memory map file. Now we have uh, another uh, advantage of paging, which is uh, fork. If you remember, we were talking about the efficiency of fork and magically fork manages to be efficient. Uh, so uh, you have 112 megabytes of memory in one process and the other one, which is forked by this process, does it going to have that or not? And this is the uh, problem here. So our demand paging example, we created 116 megabytes of memory and assume that process forked after having all of that memory resident, 100 megabytes of memory resident and it forked. Am I going to copy all these physical frames into this newly forked chart? And the answer is, no. And that mechanism is called copy on write. Uh, the thing is, I only have to copy those pages if they are different from each other. If they are same, I don't need to copy them. I can share them as if it was shared memory. So parent and child shares memory, basically. Uh, in the address translation level. They both uh, translate into the same physical frame. But the semantics is not like that. For read-only pages, there is no problem. But for read-write pages, if one changes the variable, the other should not see that change. It needs to have another variable or older value of that variable. How we handle that? Again, we are using this lazy approach. We delay this duplication until it changes. How it is possible? How operating system will know that the page has changed? CPU is simply updating an area and operating system is not aware of that actually, unless we do something, we, unless we do some trick and uh, if you remember, the mechanism between the CPU and the memory management subsystem is page fault. We can use page fault actually. However, in order to get a page fault, we should have some invalid instruction. And this memory access should be invalid. Um, the mechanism is you are trying to write something which is not writable. So what we are going to do is we will have read write areas, but we are going to mark them as read only. So that when CPU tries to write it, we are going to generate a page fault, a protection fault, so that operating system can intervene and make the trick. So it, it will uh, work like this. So parent has this page table entry pointing to this, and child is initialized to have exactly same page table entry. So this frame is pointed by two, uh, two PTEs. Uh, and in this mechanism, if you don't do something specific, if child changes, parent values will change. If parent values will change, child will change as well. However, what I can do is I can mark them read only. Even though this frame, the heap, stack, initialized, uninitialized variables are read-write areas, I mark them to be read-only. So that page fault can kick in. When child or parent writes the page, operating system will get a page fault. You are trying to make a write access to a read-only page. And then what happens? 
operating system will see that, okay. Okay, I get a page fault, but the page fault is on heap. So here it is written as read writes. However, this page table entry is read only. Okay. So this is read only. Read only, I am getting a protection fault, but it is read write. There's something wrong with this. So the operating system will understand that this is a copy on write request. So it is going to take the necessary action what uh, is called as break copy on write. So it is going to make a duplicate and then mark all of the pages read write in the PTE so that next request will be uh, done on the different memory areas. Uh, actual life actually we uh, this child's area is duplicated and this one uh, will still be read only actually and then it is broken but the it is a detail the thing is this is called copy on write uh, break so we talk about mechanisms of page fault uh, if it's an error look at the mapping if it's a legal mapping, try to recover it. Uh, bring it from the secondary storage, create zero pages, uh, so that implement demand paging, uh, provide shared uh, access to shared memory or memory mapped files, and copy on write between parent and child. So these are our mechanisms. Uh, now we are going to go back to address translation. And uh, if you remember, we have a problem with address translation. Uh, which is uh, the uh, here's the if I can find that so in the page table size we have large page tables in the single level and since uh, in addition to demand paging and the other mechanisms uh, that page table will be uh, not fully utilized, mostly fragmented. So we will only use very small amount of virtual memory area per process. So in order to deal with this, what we need to do is we need to uh, have a better page table architecture. Instead of a single level page table, uh, table we can create multiple levels. Uh, so we are going from this uh, linear array layout into some tree-like layout. We uh, divide our uh, virtual address space into three parts instead of two parts. So offset is the same as usual. So it is basically kept as the same like this. Uh, we have a primary page table. It is similar to uh, the single level page table, but it points to it points to uh, other page tables. So we will have a sequence of page tables, and this one will point to those sequence of page tables. Okay, uh, and in the uh, when I follow this primary page table from this table, I'm going to find one page. And within that page, I have multiple PTEs, page table entries. And by following this secondary page number, I will find the actual PTE, which is going to give me the frame number. Uh, the advantage of this is the fragmentation. So in case this memory address space is fragmented. I will have all these black entries here. That means I don't need to allocate some of those tables at all. So they are not allocated at all. 
I am only going to allocate uh, the required page tables. Also, within the secondary page tables, I will have invalid entries as well. So I'm going to only need uh, the areas that are used by the processes mapped. As a result, uh, the actual uh, practical size of the page table will be much more smaller in multiple levels. So this is the uh, idea of uh, multi-level page tables. Uh, what we do is usually we keep this uh, secondary page table uh, with page size, so four kilobytes, so that it will fit into uh, memory better. They can be maintained as if uh, ordinary pages, they can be swept out, swept in, so uh, they are practically like any uh, frame uh, that we can use. So in the same example, if you have uh, like 1 million pages are mapped, so you will have, uh, but you are not using all of them. So in the page table entries, uh, you can uh, swap them out on secondary storage. And this is another advantage. Okay, so it is uh, like this, so we can, maintain some of them on disk, so swap out. Uh, there might be invalid areas here and so on. So you don't spend much. For example, invalidating an entry here is getting rid of whole page of memory. Okay. Uh, so we can bring in, in, bring out in secondary storage and so on. And also in the demand paging, initially this primary page table can be uh, full with uh, invalid entry so that no secondary page table is allocated at all. As you hit here in the demand paging, the corresponding page table is created, corresponding frame is allocated, and you start using that. Uh, so in the uh, same example, uh, assuming uh, for a single process, Assume we have 10, 10, 12, so we will have 32 bits architecture. Primary page table will be like uh, four kilobytes page size. Secondary page table is also four kilobytes. Uh, this is actually a 386 architecture of Intel. Uh, two levels page tables with four kilobytes of pages, so it will fit perfectly into 32 bits. Uh, so uh, when uh, this primary page table entry hits a page fault, secondary page table is allocated and the frame is allocated and uh, the values are put back and propagated. Uh, so in the page fault now, instead of a single page access, we will have two page access. And this is the disadvantage of uh, the uh, multi-level page tables. The number of page accesses will be increasing instead of a, a single lookup in the uh, single level. Now I have one lookup, secondary page table, another lookup, and find it. I need to fetch one, two uh, memory uh, words in order to get the uh, frame number. Uh, you can have multiple uh, page tables, uh, like three, four, like in 64-bit uh, Intel architecture. In that case, you will have four accesses. Uh, but if you have a good TLB, uh, it will not be a big issue. Uh, and of course, if you swap out also, this I.O. is involving in the process. Uh, so this will give you an idea of uh, Intel uh, architecture. Intel uh, has uh, contemporary architectures, uh, the latest architectures. They uh, separated uh, the uh, 
uh, instruction cache from the uh, data cache so that they are using uh, two different channels for instruction and data. Also, it is similar, uh, it's the same way for uh, TRB. Uh, and we have level one, level two, level three, and level one size is quite uh, small. Uh, in level two, you get like 200 uh, quarter of a megabyte, and in the level three, we have eight megabyte, but level three is shared by uh, multiple uh, cores, and per core, we have only uh, those half a megabyte of TLB and a quarter of a megabyte uh, data cache. Uh, so this is the entries of four-way or eight-way, that means uh, how much of the uh, cache is associated, how much is uh, shared. Uh, and then this is uh, the main memory. The worst case is going back to main memory. So this TLBs uh, are uh, making the address translation possible. And after up the address translation, the physical memory mapping is going through this uh, part of the cache. Uh, so I will not go into uh, details of the symbols. We have uh, indexes, physical page offsets, cache index, cache tag, and so on. So uh, we will have different uh, number of addresses in virtual and physical, and we can have different page sizes. Uh, so this is the cache architecture of uh, TRB. So CPU gives you virtual page numbers and the virtual page offset. Uh, it will go into this uh, 30, uh, 32 uh, lines from here and four lines from here. So this uh, is the associative part. And uh, the four uh, lines are sharing same associative entry. So this is... Uh, this will give you an entry. Within that entry, you will uh, determine the corresponding value based on this four. And uh, of course, uh, there is a chance that this entry doesn't contain your virtual page number. Uh, so you have to compare, uh, or it compares the whole virtual page number with the retrieve value. If it is equal, it is an hit. So it will give you the physical page number and you will uh, happily go and fetch that address through this second part, which is the cache data or instruction cache. Uh, what, uh, what if there is a uh, miss? If it is a miss, you will go here, which is the uh, four level uh, uh, page tables of Intel 64 bit architecture. So it is nine by nine by nine by nine, four levels of uh, page tables. Uh, so th at the top level, we have a page containing uh, the entries of this. And we have a CR3 register pointing to start of this page. Per process, we have a different CR3. That means when I context switch, I update the CR3 so that I'm going to uh, point to start of another tree. So this is like a tree. Uh, so first part, part portion will give you this entry. You get the PTE, visit this page table, second portion, third, third portion will give you fourth, and fourth will contain the actual uh, physical page number or frame number. And the architecture we have uh, uh, different PT types uh, for page table entries and the uh, PT is for actual uh, frame numbers. Uh, so they uh, look like uh, similar, but uh, the uh, names are uh, changing slightly. Uh, we have protection bits, uh, user or supervisor. This is a new thing. Some uh, pages are reserved for super user only, so they normal ordinary user cannot map them. Uh, cache policy for the chat page. 
uh, reference bit is about uh, MMU. Uh, page size, also different page sizes are supported uh, in uh, level one PTs. In level one PTs, you can use four megabyte uh, page, for example. Uh, and we have four uh, bits reserved for or given for uh, the physical frame address of page table for the next level. Uh, and X is about instruction fetches. If it's an instruction fetch, fetch and it is uh, set, it's going to reject it. It's going to be rejected. Uh, and this is like reference bit, uh, or valid bit, sorry. If it is, it is valid bit. If it is uh, zero, it is not in memory, so it is a, a page fault. The same thing here, we have P. This is the PTs for the uh, actual PTs uh, for physical frames. And we have reference bit. In addition to that, we have uh, dirt a bit. So this dirt a bit is uh, about uh, the swapping. Uh, if a memory area is dirty, uh, when you are deallocating it, you have to write it back on disk. That means you need IO in order to deallocate that page. Uh, but if it is not dirty, you can get rid of it because that means uh, the data on disk is equal to data in memory. So you can simply delete it. Uh, for read-only, there is no such problem, but for uh, read-write pages, this dirty bit is important. Uh, if CPU updates it, this dirty bit is set, and as a result, uh, when you are deallocating, the operating system is deallocating that page, it will start an I.O. and then deallocate it. Uh, so this is our picture. And uh, this is uh, the uh, Linux uh, memory area. Uh, we have one important part of the memory, which is uh, the kernel. Sorry. And this area, the kernel, is uh, fixed for all of the processes so that you don't have to take kernel out in all the time. Kernel is always in the memory, but it is uh, beyond access of the uh, user processes. If a user process tries to write that region, it is going to get a page fault. As a result, it will get a protection fault. Uh, and you can see that in the PMAP here. So in this PMAP, so this is the zero parts, the bottom part, and at the top, all pages ends up here. That means from here to FFFF blah is reserved for kernel, and kernel is somewhere out there, and you don't have an access to that area. Uh, we have one interesting thing here. Uh, which is the user stack and runtime heap, this one and this one. Heap grows this way and user stack grows that way. This is the stack pointer and the register for a process. And this is called break. So when you like to uh, grow, you have a special system called making this break. In some systems, it is automatic. And it will grow this way, and this one will grow that way. Uh, so we keep track of that information, this mapping in a special data structure uh, within the kernel. And it is called the segment structure or virtual memory area structure. In Unix, it is called segmentation and segments. In Linux, it is called VM area. So for a process, we have this. This is like process control block of Linux task structure. In that we have MM. MM goes to this MM structure. 
we have an important register here, which is going to uh, store the uh, our page table, global directory address table, which is our CR3, if you remember. The address translation uh, entry point is this one, is stored here. And we have this mappings, and those mappings are in VM area structures. So each line you are seeing in our examples on PMAP as an entry of this area structure and starts the protections, the flags, and so on. So each one has such a structure. Also, we have a tree like structure so that given the address, the kernel can automatically find the VM area structure. And copy and uh, write works this way. We have this VM protection, which is read write, but you are uh, having a protection fault because it's read only. That means to say, uh, copy and write. Uh, VM flex contains it is shared or private protection pro uh, stores read write or executable uh, area, and it's very we keep that information. Uh, the advantage of such a mapping is uh, you can use shared libraries this way. Okay. So you can have mappings of files, etc., easily. Uh, and uh, you can generate uh, relocatable codes. Your relocatable codes can be put into any arbitrary segments. And you will have this um, semantics of memory areas. Uh, kept in a data structure. So this part is for executable, this part is for data, this one grows, this one cannot, and so on. All these informations are information is kept in here. Uh, so uh, now uh, knowing this and remembering this, uh, let us see what page fault brings us. If you get your read or write here, which is not a mapped area, you will end up in an error, segmentation fault. Because you are trying to access a page that does not exist and you are not allowed to access. And it is a segmentation fault. It is easy, just give the signal and it is going to kill the process uh, eventually. Uh, another uh thing you can do is writing a text region a text region is marked as read only and you are trying to write it again this is an error and it is called the protection fault because you are violating the permissions trying to write a read only area the third is a page fault is trying to read data section or write data section what will happen? In that case, it is a normal page fault. It is a recoverable uh, page fault. And in order to do that, you need to follow this. So in case of a page fault, we have our virtual address and the PT that it contains and type of access is taken by the operating system. And the corresponding virtual memory area is a lookup. As I said, there is a tree version of that linked list, and in that I can find which segment it maps to, which is our PMAP output line. Okay. Uh, then if you couldn't find it, it is a segmentation fault. the segmentation fault. If the protection, sorry, I lost my cursor again. Okay. If a protection of the PT is read only, but memory area is right, it means it's a copy on write. So I need to break it. I need to break this copy on write. So I will have this handle call. I'm going, I'm going to mention in a moment. Uh, if this type of access is okay for this area, however, PT is not valid, that means 
I need to uh, find a way to load that page into memory. Otherwise, the access is not correct, so I'm going to give a protection fault. Uh, sometimes Sigbus, sometimes uh, segmentation fault, you can uh, get that. Okay. And so now, how we can load a page? Let us talk about that. Due to demand paging, uh, usually this case is due to demand paging and we need to load it. So what we do is we allocate a new page, that's page alloc. Uh, if area is backed by a file, we are going to look for the file. If it is already mapped, we can use the existing page. If it is not, we can uh, initialize the data segments by them and so on. Uh, so this back by file case uh, can be either memory map file or uh, initialized data segments coming from uh, the uh, binary or it can be swept out, reused in the past but swept out. So we start the I.O. and sleep until I.O. is available. So this is the place the uh, process sleeps in order to access a memory area. Because IO takes long, but the CPU cannot wait. We cannot make it busy wait. So what we need to do is we need to wait until IO is complete, so we are going to go and sleep. So you are making a simple uh, memory access instruction and you went on sleep. This is possible through this page fault backed by file load page case. Otherwise we initialize that to zero and we marked PT as valid. Protection is uh, taken from protection of the uh, virtual memory area and our new address, the frame number in the PT is our page number from this new page in the physical memory. And we update address translation with this new uh, PT. Also, it will update uh, TLB so that when I go back from interrupt, CPU will try exactly the same instruction. And same instruction will access memory and it's going to find it on uh, the page table. It will update TLB and it's going to access TLB in the next time. So this is the page fault and copy and write is slightly more complicated. Uh, so we have this uh, page is in the PT available. For each page, page we have to keep count of this number of references. So for the uh, child and parent case, number of references should be two if copy and write is not broken yet. If it is one, the situation is easy. I am the only one left uh, which has uh, access to that page. So I am going to mark that page as, uh, sorry, read, write, and that's it. Uh, and update the address translation, of course, this PT should be propagated. Else, I allocate a new page, copy page from the old page, uh, update my PT, mark it as valid, valid, and update PT address with the new page address. Uh, I will decrement number of references and go. So child, for example, parent and child are in this situation, number of references is two. I go here, number of references is two. Parent and child can do it, let us assume it's parent. Parent would allocate a new page, copy existing page, uh, it was going to update its PTE, read, write. It is going to be marked as one. Address is set to new page. Number of references is decremented. It will become one. And I am going to update address translation, virtual address, PTE, and then go out. When child tries to update it, it's going to enter the exactly same place. 
and see this as one, mark it as right and go. And this can be repeated 30 times. If you fork 30 times, you will have number of references 30. This is going to be 29, 28, 27. Everyone is updating its own variables and at the end it will go one and there will be 30 copies of it. Uh, at this position, I'm going to ask you a question and I am not going to give you the answer. In a typical journal, uh, there is a copy and write page which has probably hundreds of references or more, of, more uh, than that. And those references can be uh, not from the parent-child relation. They can be from different processes. And there are hundreds of references to this specific, very interesting page. Boring at the same time. Uh, what is this page? This is my question. So please answer it in uh, our uh, forum, in our uh, department, discourse uh, group. Uh, I will not give you a hint for a, for a while. If you cannot answer this question, I'm going to give you a hint. So now uh, we talk about most of the interesting parts, but I would like to mention something else how stack and heap grows. If you remember in this uh, load page case, we have uh, this, if uh, the pages from a valid address, uh, sorry, this one, protection is valid and it is mapped, we try to load page. So heap and uh, stack grows this way. Uh, however, uh, some operating system make it auto uh, growth or auto shrink. The idea is this, uh, if your excess is in the boundary of an area and you grow in the same direction, you simply uh, grow that area during the load page and stack will go up and or stick will go from larger to smaller and the uh, heap will grow from smaller to larger and this way uh, by accessing the boundary uh, we can make our stack grow or shrink so just let me show you uh, unfortunately i'm losing my cursor here so uh, it is not a good idea so assume this is my heap so this is heat and uh, I am making an excess okay. I'm making an excess to uh, that exact location, okay? Uh, okay, now what will happen? So I'm in the just next page trying to access that page. So I'm trying to grow my hip just one page above. So the page fold handler will understand this and since heap is a, marked as a growable, it will grow it automatically. So we have such a uh, uh, implementation trick. And the heap we can uh, use um, in some operating system, they use a special system called break in order to make this grow. However, in stack, we don't have that chance. In the stack, stack is something uh, we just push activation records. So there is no special system call for that. And stake automatically grows that way. Uh, now I'm going to stop uh, with two examples I would like to show you uh, complete uh, today's 
video is how we grow our second heap. I code heap grow is similar to demand paging code. Uh, the important difference is instead of locating in a single line, now I have a loop of 30,000 times. I am allocating one kilobyte of memory just in order to make it resident, I am accessing it and then sleep for a while and report it. The idea here is this code will have 30,000 times allocate one kilobyte. So it's going to allocate 30 uh, million bytes. Uh, in order to show you that this, uh, I'm going to show you how process map changes. So now let us execute this code 30,000 times allocate one kilobyte. Okay. Again, it is waiting for me to make it go on. This is called heap growth. So I am going to make a map of that. Okay, so this one, uh, but I would like to show you this uh, in a loop so that you will see how it changes. I'm going to have a leap and show. So it is something like this. It is showing me current case. So I would like to, I would like you to focus on. Uh, this okay, so this entry basically, uh, and of course, the size here. Okay, now I'm going to let this code go. As you can see. As I allocated, the size of the heap is getting larger and larger. Uh, however, the start address here does not change. Okay, so this address remains the same. Okay, uh, so heap will grow from smaller to larger, uh, and when it uh, allocates this. 30 megabytes of memory, it is going to finish, okay? Uh, this is not related to demand paging, but how uh, segments grow, okay? Uh, I have another example to show you how uh, stack grow. It is like this, I have a recursive function that I call recurse. And in that recursive function, I have one kilobyte of memory. I make it resident by this. But this is not about uh, if address is resident or not, but it's about segment size. Uh, and it is making same thing, sleeping for a while and recursing. So it will, it is going to recurse 5,000 times and it will make 5,000 time activation record of this record of this recurse and 5,000 times it's going to create this local variable X. So it means five uh, megawatts uh, of stack will be created. Uh, in a typical system, a stack is limited by eight megawatts in order to avoid this. Uh, infant recursion problems. So I have chosen five megabytes. Well, now I am going to start my application that program, and we are going to observe stack growth. Loop. I would like to. I would like you to focus on uh, the stack in this case, the 
size of the stack and now this number as well okay now i let it go as you can see stack is growing but since uh, the stack is from higher number to lower number as you push it is uh, so you have to uh, in increment it at the top so that you have to uh, change the start offset of this variable instead of the regular offset okay and so this is how uh, they grow uh, the uh, copy on right is hard to uh, observe but you can observe this way you can create a very large uh, process and you make it fork multiple times and you observe resident sizes of the processes uh, and systems total memory and when they start uh, writing the pages you will see that total amount of physical memory in the system will drop uh, drastically because they are creating duplicates so for example 500 megabytes of uh, resident memory they fork three times that means four times 500 two gigabytes of memory uh, but instead they are using 500 then you can uh, observe the remaining physical memory of the system so thanks for watching uh, remember my question uh, what which page has many number of references and uh, a candidate for copy and write uh, so Today I'm going to stop and uh, I will come with another uh, video which is related to uh, what will going to happen if our system is short of memory. So we need to uh, get some of the pages out of the physical memory, keep them out of the physical memory. And this is called memory eviction and we are going to talk about that. Thank you very much for watching. See you in another session.